Hi everyone, today I'm finally going to be reviewing this awesome book, Forever Amber by Kathleen Windsor, which I recently read for the second time. I had thought I had brought my own original copy with me when I moved to South Carolina, but unfortunately it seemed like my um, 1945, I'm um, 16th um, printing of the book, which is like, you know, totally awesome green hardcover, the text on two columns on very thin papers, presumably because of, you know, like the wartime paper shortages and rationing. It just, it seemed to have gone into like a box with some other books I had specifically meant to come with me when I moved. So unfortunately that was in storage and I had to get it out of the library. And I, I loved it just as much as when I had first read it 19 years ago. Sometime, I think it was like in the spring, summer of um, 2004 when I was 20 four years old and in some ways I loved it even more than I did then because you know I, certain life experiences I had not yet had when I was 24 so I was still very naive about some things like I didn't like understand certain things that were happening I, I guess I'll talk a little bit about that and also obviously the you know the cognitive development even at 24 you're not like nearly as cognitive well you're almost all the way there of course but you're not as like cognitively developed as like I am now at like going to be um 44 years old um next um, um, tomorrow so obviously like so many things it's different and so I'm trying to say it's one of those books that you know you can read it differently at different stages in life and it means different things to you and certain things I pop out to you and I have read uh, a couple of uh, obviously I give the book you know five stars even I would say like you know six stars out of five it's that freaking good but I have you know read some one star reviews and a lot of them obviously I understand not clicking with the characters or the story or the writing it's just not your cup of tea just respect that and realize oh maybe some other story would be a better fit for me but a lot of people giving this book one star reviews they're like her der amber isn't a good character and Bruce is even worse and Bruce makes it clear from the jump he has no interest in marrying her and he's just kind of stringing her along yeah obviously that's kind of the whole point of their relationship and the characters and the story of yeah of course Amber isn't like the most nicest person on paper she's very much like Scarlett O'Hara many people have made the comparison um forever Amber is reads really really like a restoration um era England I'm um, gone with the wind because for so many reasons you know like this woman just rises up from you know nothing well, obviously like Scarlett does come from money but Amber really does not come from money at least at from the time she's born and like she has to do so many things to like get ahead in life and you know society and get money and respect and like social prestige and position and unfortunately particularly in those respective eras that just really wasn't possible for just about any woman you could think of unless she you know married or took you know certain lovers you know like it or not that's just how society was um structured and yet I dare you to write a book where characters are unrealistically perfect goody goodies they always make the correct decisions that you know settle down with the perfect um partner they realize oh this person just is never going to give me a straight answer he's stringing me along he really has made it clear he does not want to marry me and eventually takes a whole other wife even though he's still you know going back and forth between me and like other women on the side maybe I should just like settle down and marry one of the past boyfriends I had who would have given me a much more stable life but th where is the story in that there's like no compelling story like and it would just be so so boring if oh Amber goes away to London with Bruce and they have an affair and she has a child with him and then she realizes oh this was a bad decision I guess I'll go back home or later I'll marry my boyfriend Captain Rex Morgan who's really really been pressing hard for marriage and really seems to love me and he would take very good care of me so I guess that settles that. Well, that's the end of the book and nothing really happened. It would be so, so freaking boring. So let's just get on with the review, which I um originally wrote this for my old Angel Fire website. I believe probably I would guess like 2004. Obviously the book was freshest in my mind then because I had just um reread it and I um, posted, I edited it down a bit for my um current um WordPress blog and um 2012 and I did like did do I did a little bit of editing of the review today like before the was making the video it wasn't like too much stuff just like for example like clearing up breaking up some run-on sentences and stuff and adding in contractions where there were none and like making making a couple of things more obvious like the particular reason why Amber like becomes an actress so oh and I should also mention this does contain some potential spoilers it does not contain like nearly the amount of spoilers that were in my old um first angel fire review because I learned like don't give away the whole book but if you have not read the book and you you know don't want to find out anything potentially spoilery that happens like you know the outcome of certain of 
Amber's relationships. Like I have plenty of other videos for you guys to watch, but if you don't mind the book being spoiled or if you have already read it, so you can just um, keep watching. And also please, you know, try to tell me like a deliberate epic saga like this wouldn't would have been just as great if it were split into a fake series or had hundreds of pages hacked out. Like why? That would be like boring. It's not nearly the same story anymore. Like some books are just meant to be supersized just as other books are meant to be very, very short. And as I've, you know, said so many times about long books like, you know, Forever Amber and Gone with the Wind and War and Peace or just about anything else super long you can easily think of like tell me exactly which characters like which chapters which scenes which like important storylines and whole like plots like running throughout the whole book could be taken out for it to be nearly the same story or how would it still feel like the same story if it were like split into like you know five six books or whatever it, it would not be the same story it just makes me sad so many people these days don't understand the concept of a deliberately you know saga length novel with a large ensemble cast spanning many years and I do agree like maybe as a modern reader I could see where they would say that I don't really see the purpose of all these chapters about like the king and his top at the time mistress and Barbara Palmer and her um, sleazy cousin um, George Duke of Buckingham and uh, some of the king's other like would-be mistresses like Francis Stewart whom he never slept with at least at the time there's speculation maybe later on after she married and came back to court and a couple of other things here and there that have nothing to do with Amber. But when you really think about it, yeah, maybe they could have been taken out or at least some of them. But a lot of, you know, the Kings and Barbara and um, Duke um, George's goings on, they eventually directly intersect with Amber's life. So it is like relevant to understanding all this, you know, like political machination, machination going on and, you know, life at the court and all this other stuff. So it does, you know, go into Amber's life. And I, this book originally was like, you know, one fifth longer so I would love to see like the original full length first first draft to see like what she actually cut out because like a few things particularly towards the end feel like this is kind of like rushed or out of nowhere I wonder what missing material might have you know cleared this one up so let's um, just get on with the review I love this book um, as so so much and so this is a sweeping historical novel much like Gone with the Wind only without the you know historical revisionism and the racism there are a few like racial racist like comments here and there but they're like nowhere near as overwhelming as they are in Gone with the Wind obviously that's a whole other book for its whole other video the modern paperback is 960 976 pages but my old hardcover from 1945 as I said the 16th printing is only 652 pages with the text on two columns on each paper thin page it takes place during the restoration era in England the years when Charles II had just come back from exile abroad, along with his cavaliers, driving out the Puritans who had been in control of England since the Civil War, which broke out in 1642. And like Gone with the Wind, the main character is a fierce, spirited, feisty, independent woman who knows what she wants and how to get it, and who also has men falling at her feet. Like Scarlet, Amber also has numerous relationships, though all the while she has only one true love in her heart, whom she hopes to be together with permanently one day. The book opens in April of 1644, when Amber's mother, Judith, Judith Marsh, has just given birth to her, an event which costs Judith, Judith her life. Judith was in love with John Mainwaring, eight years her senior, and was all set to marry him when the Civil War broke out, and Judith's father declared for Charles I. John declared for Cromwell and the Parliamentarians, and so the match, which had been decided on since Judith was very young and they later eventually mutually fell in love when, when John realized, oh, this woman is, you know, like 15, 16 years old now and she's no longer a stupid little girl. She's actually a desirable young lady relatively close to my own age now. And then the match was called off. Judith, however, is still madly in love with John. And when he secretly comes to see her one day, in between the fighting, they sleep together for the first time. Judith soon finds herself pregnant, but conceals the pregnancy for probably longer than most women nowadays would be able to find ways to do, although obviously where there's a will, there's a way, particularly when you don't want like anyone around you, particularly your parents, like finding out you're pregnant out of wedlock as a teenager. Her parents also select for her future husband, a 35-year-old widower with a young infant son, Edmund Mortimer, Earl of Radcliffe a short, ugly man who repulses her, and Judith fights heartily against her impending marriage. Just when it's getting harder to hide her pregnancy, 
and as her wedding date is drawing nearer, she receives a letter from John promising protection to her family against the oncoming battle in the area, but Judith's mother will have no part of it. Judith ri runs away to be with John, and he takes her to the village of Mary Green, where he presents her to a couple named Matthew and Sarah, saying she's his wife, Mrs. St. Clair, and gives them a story about why they fled to this area. No one thinks any differently, and so Judith stays there in peace and safety until her daughter is born, and she's like f thinking to herself, oh, I'm so disappointed it's a girl instead of a boy. Unfortunately, the you know, like internalized misogyny was definitely a thing, particularly in those days, and feeling like, oh, a boy must be automatically superior, even though I'm not male myself. But, you know, unfortunately, we just can't get away. That was a very real attitude in that era and even into the modern era in many societies, even, unfortunately, in some places in the West. So Judith names her daughter Amber after the beautiful color of John's eyes. The real meat of the story begins on the 5th of May, 1660, when King Charles II and the Cavaliers return to England after the hated Cromwell and his killjoy band of Puritans have finally been given the boot. Amber is out doing some chores for Sarah, whom she believes is her aunt, when she sees some of these men, and being the brazen girl she is, and quite the victim of village gossip, she approaches them to find out who they are and what they're doing here. Two of them are the Earl of Almsbury, John, and his friend Lord Bruce Carleton, age 29, whom Amber instantly falls madly in love with. She makes up her mind to win Bruce, and the next day there's a local fair which she attends with him. All is going very, very well, like Bruce even buys her some really, really nice earrings she takes a liking to, until she sees her spiteful cousin Agnes and some other village girls looking at them together. After sneaking off and having sex, Amber decides she, she just can't go back there, knowing they all saw them and will tell everyone. She's had enough of Mary Green and demands Bruce, Bruce take her with him to London, which he does. And this is one of the edits I actually just made on this morning on the blog post. I naively believed when I read the book at 24, they only made out when they like snuck off together. I thought, yeah, Bruce is like trying to have like full sex with her, but like Amber pushes him off because like, you know, she's scared and she's a virgin and it's getting way too real too quickly for her but yeah reading the book again at age 43 it was obvious yeah they did have sex although it was obviously like very like shocking for Amber like you know being a 16 year old virgin but I just in my mind I was unfortunately like you know, an antique virgin I was still a virgin myself at age 24 when I still read the book so I genuinely did not you know understand that scene was implying they actually really did have sex I had thought like they were only you know making out and they only started you know having sex for real after they go to London so you know like being naive is you know kind of like it just you know hurts your mind when you don't have these experiences at the normal age Amber and Bruce lived together in relative harmony during the summer of 1660 until Bruce sails off to America to become a privateer at which he's very successful Amber is heartbroken, but is consoled by the thought that she's pregnant with Bruce's baby and will always have a part of him, no matter what. After Bruce leaves, she leaves the place they were staying at and is soon befriended by Mrs. Sally Goodman, to whom she tells a fish story about being a rich heiress, waiting for her aunt to come back from abroad. Amber tells her she's promised to an earl, though it's against her own better judgment when she decides to marry Sally's horrible nephew, Luke channel who he was just so ugly and repulsive and abusive just gross uh, this guy had took taken a real liking to amber she feels it's the only way to save herself from the shame of unwed motherhood and i just feel like many people these days particularly women under a certain age they just like, take for granted all these freedoms so you see all these like women like happily matter of factly announcing oh my boyfriend and i are having a baby i'm so excited or you know just having a kid by someone you just said like a one night stand with or friends with benefits and they just don't understand until like a few decades ago that being pregnant when you were not married that was just like something you didn't do or if you did do it there was like so much social shame and I just you know wish obviously I, I hope we never go back to that kind of like culture but just so many women they just like don't understand like you know this is like a freedom like our foremothers like within our own lifetimes that they could never have dreamt of saying oh my boyfriend and I are having a baby yay and we're not even in a hurry to get married so it's just like a completely different world back then from what it is today both her friendship with Sally and her marriage to Luke goes south almost immediately they not only figure out Amber was pregnant when she got married but also that her story about being a rich heiress wasn't real Sally, Luke, and Amber's maid, Honor Mills, yeah, very, very fitting name for that woman, 
turn out to be primetime swindlers and make off with all the money Bruce gave her before he left England. All 500 pounds, as well as nearly all her material possessions, while Amber is at an inn which she went to with Luke under pretext of reconciliation. Luke ran off, what a dastardly double-crosser, and left her with the tab, which of course she hadn't a single red cent to pay it with. But because she's now bankrupt, she's thrown into a debtor's prison in Newgate, a hellhole which she later escapes with notorious criminal and escape artist Black Jack Mallard. And when she went back to the place where she was staying, she found the earrings Bruce bought for her at the fair and her brightly colored on Budgie, her parakeet, and I think a few other things, but basically all the money was gone. She did not have the best, you know, hiding place for it, and she did not leave it with a goldsmith like Bruce advised her to, but later on she leaves all of her money with um, Shadrach, a new bold, like, and he makes really good decisions about her money, keeps it safe, even like when she thought, oh, now he's really lost it because of like, the plague and the great fire of London and my latest husband trying to take my money, but, you know, Shadrach, you know, he always does an excellent job of, like, safeguarding her money, so, but, you know, you know, you live and learn, you know, particularly because she's so young the first time this happens. Black Jack and Amber live in Whitefriars, a very bad section of town. Along with their maid, Pal, it is spelled on P-A-L-L, maybe it's pronounced Paul or Pal or whatever, Jack's other lover, Bess, who hates Amber, and Mother Redcap, an old spinster who runs the place. Things start out well enough, but soon Amber finds herself more tricked and in debt than before. During this time, she has her baby, whom she naturally names Bruce, with no surname giving because she feels like um, she's going to be, I guess, admitting she's an unwed mother if she gives it her own name or and she doesn't feel like it's, I guess, like not her place to give the baby Bruce's name. So I guess like, you know, her hands are tied all around. And so she just feels like it's better if he doesn't have any surname at all. There won't be any like question or suspicion or gossip or rumors no matter what might happen she wants to nurse bruce jr himself herself but is prevailed upon to get a wet nurse to raise him so she won't ruin her figure at least that was the reason put forth in those days instead of saying it was mortally dangerous for omen to nurse her kids with her own breast milk like when um natasha um in the la i believe a part um seven of war and peace like everyone is shocked oh you're nursing your baby yourself oh you could kill yourself and like she's yeah i want to nurse my own baby and even change the diapers so you know like good for her for saying like you know this isn't dangerous there's just you've been unfortunately a lot of misinformation about nursing over the years and even today but obviously that's again complete off topic for another subject it's also better for little bruce to be raised away from whitefriars which has a high infant mortality rate after recovering from childbirth Life with Black Jack becomes even seedier and more dangerous, with Amber forced into taking part in the crimes and swindling operations of Jack and Bess. Bess and Amber really don't get along, and finally Jack orders Bess out after one too many scenes. However, Bess destroyed all of Amber's clothes before she left, and now Jack really wants to hunt her down so he can punish her. Amber herself tried to escape earlier, but it isn't until the police crack down on Jack and Bess during a con operation which Amber was executing, that she finally manages to escape and flees back to London with her tutor, Michael Godfrey. Once back in London, Amber becomes an actress, a profession which only very recently was open to women and which gives her protection from prosecution or arrest on account of the theater being under the protection of the king. Though she's hated by most of the girls, she does very well for herself and goes from being an extra to having a few lines to being in leading roles and very, very popular and in demand, particularly with like guys who like see her on the stage and want to sleep with her. She also gets bored of Michael during this time and is very relieved when Michael Sr. comes to pay Michael a visit. For Michael has dropped out of college and isn't living the way his family expected of him. And Amber has also been um, pregnant by Michael during this relationship, but she had an abortion. She later goes on to have um, t at least two more abortions that are mentioned in the text. Michael is forced to go home. And with him out of her hair, like she was really, really getting tired of him, she soon moves in on the handsome Captain Rex Morgan, who up till then was the lover of her leading rival, Beck. Soon they're living together, though Amber resists marrying him for a very long time, even with the constant pleading of her maiden Nan, because not only would she be a bigamist, but also because she'd have to give up her career in purse strings. And she's a, a she makes no bones about it. She's a kept woman, like keeping is like very like, you know, 
successful for a woman who did not want to get married during that time. Like she could have like independence, like a home of her own provided for by the dude who was keeping her and like she can order in meals and she can even have like servants and stuff, but she won't have to like, for example, well, I mean, obviously pregnancy is always like a real risk, particularly before real birth control, but she wouldn't really have to risk like, you know, pregnancy and becoming like a, a brood mare, like a woman who was like married off and out in the country so she just feels this gives her more freedom as a woman to like do like different things that wouldn't be open to her otherwise twice during this blissful idol she also sleeps with the king whom she came to the attention of while she was on the stage and i like really wish maybe that was some of the material which um mrs um windsor had to edit out of her manuscript to get it like down relatively short like there just isn't any detail just like oh the king sent for me and or sent for amber and like she goes off to sleep with him and she comes back with like a big bag of gold coins he gave her and she's so excited and like happy and bragging about it like I would think that was something like if I were writing that kind of story I would like have all these details about like Amber actually going to the palace and sleeping with the king and then coming back instead of just like kind of more like telling about it after the fact just that maybe that really was one of the things which was edited out and so a Amber has finally agreed to marry Rex when Bruce comes back to England and because she can't resist rekindling her romance with her child's father, they sneak off to be together often. Captain Morgan eventually figures out what's going on, coupled with the fact that Amber's son is a spitting image of Lord Carlton and even has his same name, and things get really ugly. I'm not, I, I think I mentioned in my original, like, Angel Fire post all those years ago just how ugly things got, but I didn't, you know, want to give away that um, spoiler in this um, review. After the demise of this relationship... Amber has many lovers, but is still aching for Rex and Bruce. So she and Nan go to a spa at Toonbridge Wells so she might recover her health. While she's there, she runs across a, or across a rich old merchant widower, 40 years her senior, Samuel Dangerfield, whom, on Nan's urging, she tricks into marriage so she can get his money. Because he's a Puritan, it takes a lot longer than any of her other conquests did. But finally, after nursing him back to health, after feeding him some mushrooms that didn't agree with him, they get married. Samuel has at least 14 surviving children by his first marriage, and only one of the youngest, 15-year-old Jemima, likes Amber. All the other members of the household, particularly the oldest daughter, Lettuce, like the feeling is mutual. This, they despise every single thing about Amber. They, they're even like shocked and scandalized by her name. Oh, who, how could you name a child Amber instead of something respectable like, you know, Catherine or Elizabeth or Mary or Lettuce or Jemima? Amber grows fond of Samuel, despite the huge age gap and how she only married him for his money. Bruce returns to England during this time, and it turns out that not only has he dined with the Dangerfield family before, but Jemima is also in love with him. Amber is furious, and nothing she says or does can convince Jemima she needs to marry Joseph Cuddle, who is 18 years old, um, three years older than Jemima, the young man already selected for her, or that Bruce couldn't possibly love her. Their formerly very close friendship shatters before long, but Amber finally wins the family's approval by urging Samuel to marry Jemima and Joseph. Unfortunately, things between Jemima and Bruce go too far, and Amber is livid when she finds this out, particularly when Jemima, on the eve of her wedding, is said to be having morning sickness. Jemima confesses her last flux, a, 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 a.k.a. A menstrual period, was two months ago. Amber is also pregnant and convinced the baby is Bruce's. Prior to this, she had three abortions by herbal remedies and rough rides and carriages, but wants this baby to secure inheriting all the money Samuel has coming to her in his will, you know, like what they don't know won't hurt them. And I should mention here, like Bruce, he obviously has a type, aka a teenage girl. He's like 29 and Amber is 16 when they first get together and he's about like 33 when he's sleeping with... 15 year old Jemima and he later marries a girl um Karina who's like you know 16 or 17 and he's 18 years older than her and there's also talk he's um sleeping with Barbara Palmer who used to be the king's favorite mistress and I think she's fairly close in age to Amber and like contrary to what many people like believe in urban legend it really was not common for couples to have giant age gaps back in the day there were like a few exceptions for example um medieval and renaissance Italy it was unfortunately very common for girls in their early teens to marry dudes who are, you know, at least like 10, 15, 20, even many more years older than that. And, and 
a little bit in um, Eastern Europe and like a few places here and there, but in England specifically for this era and many, most other places like, you know, Europe and the United States um, colonies that really was not common for a teenage girls to be getting married. The average um, marriage age that seem historically is usually ranged from about maybe like 18 to 26. I can go higher or lower depending on, you know, the era and the particular setting and what socioeconomic class a woman comes from and the age gap between partners is usually was usually about like one to six years maybe it might sometimes it would go up to maybe like 10 years but even that wasn't as common as like one to six years to say nothing of it was not normal for like girls who were like you know 15 16 17 years old to be marrying or having like sex with like men who were you know like 10 like 13 like 15 18 20 years older that that's just an urban myth I just like you know totally wish it would die and I did like Bruce and definitely he is like worse than Amber I do agree with the one star reviewers because he is like stringing her along during all this time if he's like serious about not wanting to marry her and they're not having like a future beyond like lo oh being like you know friends with benefits and they also have a couple of kids together why doesn't he just you know leave but again there wouldn't really be much of a compelling story if like Amber just listened to him and like went away and like pursued a guy who did want to settle down and Bruce like was true to his word and like oh I'm not coming back again this time I'm really serious so you know after her second marriage ends with Samuel's death of old age Amber and her maid Nan leave the oppressive Dangerfield house and go back to London during which time Amber has a girl Susanna this is during 1665 and the plague that struck so fiercely in London that year it's just beginning when they arrive in their new quarters after Amber's lying in. Nan is terrified, but Amber insists on waiting till Bruce's ship comes in. Even after relenting and sending Nan and the servants away, Amber still waits in the plague-stricken city until word comes from one of her servants that Bruce's ship has landed. But all doesn't work out according to her plans for them to have a private dinner together and then join her entourage of servants in the country, for Bruce immediately comes down with the plague and probably already had it when he landed in London. Amber nurses him through his sickness until she falls ill, during which time Bruce, though he's weakened and still recovering, nurses her back to health. They go through three different nurses during this period, the last of whom tries to murder them. After both are sufficiently recovered, they leave London on Almsbury's yacht and join the Almsbury's and Amber's children and servants. And the plague chapters are among the most you know, like gripping of this whole novel. Like Mrs. Windsor did like so, so much research and it really, really shows. I, you know, felt like I was actually with them there and then you're know, like plague stricken home and like people are like dying in the streets and calling like bring out your dead and people are terrified to go anywhere or even accept like coins from people to buy things in case the coin might be infested and all these like nurses they have like caring for them are like oh I'm gonna help myself to their food because I'm not just a nurse I'm actually a thief who's doing this for a little bit of you know, like a paycheck I'm not I mean, they, it was not you know like an era of like serious nurses like who went to nursing school caring for these people because of Bruce's career as a privateer, it isn't long before he has to leave again. He has to go to London while the plague is still dying to see if, well, see, it's still dying down, to see if his ships haven't been pillaged and ransacked while he was away. Amber is furious he wouldn't let him go with her, and that he left without saying goodbye. But Almsbury comforts her a little by telling her there's a guest who think, thinks she's very beautiful. Edmund Mortimer, Earl of Radcliffe, and I should also mention Amber, also has like an on-again, off-again relationship with Almsbury, and I do agree with people who feel like he's pretty much the only man throughout the book who like genuinely loves her for how she is. He's you know, honest with her. He's, he has his own wife and children, and he's not, obviously not expecting marriage from her, but he's just, you know, like he understands what makes Amber tick, and like he knows what they're getting out of their like, you know, on-again, off-again, friends with benefits relationship, unlike a lot of these, you know, like other guys. So on this Edmund Mortimer dude is about 57 years old and barely taller than Amber and not very attractive either in bo both physical appearance and as a person. But Amber decides to enter into her third marriage so she can become a countess. She instantly regrets it, for Edmund only married her to get full legal rights over her vast fortune, which he wants to pay off the massive death debts he has rung up over the past 25 years. Edmund is controlling, petty, mean-spirited, impotent, abusive, and just in general makes her life miserable. He also sends away Amber's young black slave Tansy, the boy whom Bruce gave her as a present a few years back, and of whom she's very fond, like this like horrible Edmund dude, he said some really racist things about Tansy. He doesn't even think he's like a human being. He like talks of him like, you know, an animal, which is just a horrible, horrible 
She prevails on him to let Tansy go to the Almsbury house, where her children have since been resettled. They've been, like, living there for a while, particularly Bruce getting, you know, his education and tutoring, instead of sending Tansy away to strangers. Last but not least, Edmund makes her leave early the night she's introduced at court, and due to his spite and jealousy, keeps her away from further appearances at court. After enough loath loathsomeness at home, Radcliffe eventually takes Amber with him to his country estate lime tree, where his oldest son, Philip, and his young pregnant wife, Jennifer, Jenny, are also saying, yeah, believe it or not, like the name Jennifer is a lot older than many people might think it is just because it only like, you know, shot up to huge popularity like during the late 20th century. That doesn't mean it, you know, didn't exist like long before then. It just, you know, wasn't like a huge, like hot trending name back in the day. Life for Amber is also rather loathsome there as well, but at least she manages to cook hold her repulsive third husband with his own son during their stay in the country. And Jenny is just like so naive. She never has any idea her husband is sleeping with another woman that, or that like Amber is anything less than she like claims she is. This affair doesn't stay undiscovered very long. Well, obviously Jenny doesn't discover it, but the husband does. And just before Radcliffe goes back to London, he tries to take revenge on both his son and wife. And I'm not going to spoil how he tries to take revenge on them. Amber is furious when he, she finds out what he tried to do and makes up her mind to gallop back to London to catch him and get back control of her money. She takes along several of her servants and disguises herself as a man, planning for her servants to murder him. And she also disguises herself as a man for fun several other times during the story. Like, you know, oh, I'm just going to ride into town uh, pretending I'm a serving boy and, like, see if my friends and the king don't recognize me. And, like, she gets a kick out of it when, like, oh, these people had no idea who I was and, like, they thought I was just, like, a young, like, foolish servant boy or whatever. As luck would have it, the Great Fire of London is ablaze as they're riding home. And now Amber not only wants to murder her worthless husband, but also to make sure he hasn't snaked off with all her money and possessions. They get into the Radcliffe house before the fire reaches it, and the fire destroys the evidence of what really caused the demise of her third marriage. Amber goes back to Lime Tree, but not for long. Soon she returns to the Almsbury's house, and, be and before long she's back at court, and once again comes to the attention of the king, whose mistress she becomes. By this point, like, Barbara is, like, fast fading as his, as his top favorite mistress, and she's very, very upset about that. She also finds herself pregnant and wants to keep it, even though she, normally she feels like, oh, this is ruining my figure. I don't want another brat yet again, because she'll, it, this baby will always remind her she was the king's mistress, even if he might get bored of her, like he did with the spiteful and scorned Mrs. Barbara Palmer, Countess of Castlemaine, who once with his, was his top mistress, but at the this point in the story, she's um, still um, living in the palace in her own little apartment quarters because she's had, you know, so many kids by the king and he feels that you know, it's only his duty to take care of her given their past relationship. Amber also knows Charles has a really good track record of loving and taking care of his many bastard children. Unfortunately, you know, he fathers children with like just about any woman you can think of except where it really counts with his own wife. She just keeps having like late term miscarriages or like not conceiving at all. The king arranges for Amber to marry Bar Baron Gerald Stanhope, who is about like a year or so older than Amber, so people won't suspect whom the true father is. He also makes Gerald, Earl of Danforth, into the bargain, something he'd been planning on doing anyway. Since Amber liked being a countess and feels baroness is a title beneath her, Gerald is henpecked from the start and fine with it. He doesn't even put up a fight over Amber still living at the Almsbury's while he lives apart from her, but they do sleep together a few times early on, so he'll be, like, convinced he really was the father and, like, she wasn't already pregnant when they got married. It's another story when his mother, Lucilla, oh, 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 oh horrible, horrible woman, comes to town. However, especially since Bruce, Bruce also comes back to London while Lucilla is with them. This time, Bruce has two bits of news that throw a dampener onto Amber's spirits, particularly that his new woman, um, the, his cradle robbed, like Corinna, from back in um, the colony of Virginia. But she deals with them as best as she can because she still loves him and feels that one day he might still be yet hers. The Dutch also invade during Bruce's stay, and though everyone in the Almsbury household flees into the country for fear of war, Amber stays behind so she won't miss hearing word of Bruce, who has gone off to fight. It isn't a very long engagement, however, and peace is quickly negotiated. Amber is made a lady of the bedchamber, which gives her the right to take up residence at Whitehall, where everyone at court lives, and soon after gives birth to her third child, though it's her sixth pregnancy, a boy whom she names Charles, after his father. Lucilla is still bothering her, and Amber successfully gets rid of that overgrown jade 
by having her married to Sir Frederick Fothergill, about half her age and young enough to be her son, knowing her mother-in-law loves younger men. The Stanhopes lost their only source of income, of revenue, in the fire. And Baroness Stanhope has been very free and loose with spending Amber's vast amounts of money. Amber knows she has to put a stop to it, like right now. She tells Frederick her mother-in-law has a total of 5,000 pounds, which was a fairly small like fortune back in the 17th century, and gives it to her on condition she never touch any of her, Amber's, money again. She doesn't care that by law the money belongs to her simpering husband. It doesn't change whose money it was all along, and I'm Shadrach Newbold is still taking very good care of Amber's fortune and like helping her to you know, earn even more money with like good investments and stuff. She also discovers Gerald is having an affair with 15-year-old Polly Stark, who later has a child with him, and agrees to give each of them a certain amount of money every year so they'll never bother her again, which also effectively gets rid of her fourth husband, and when Polly gives birth to her child, she, you know, sends her a nice little gift, so it's not like she has any hard feelings at all towards this woman, though Amber has gotten everything she ever dreamt of, including her most recent desire of getting a duchy, and thus the title of duchess, in an even more lavish place of dwelling, which she has a lot of fun, you know, building and, like, you know, constructing and decorating and throwing parties in. Charles makes her and Gerald, Duke and Duchess of Ravenspur. She still can't get the one thing she wants most in this world, Bruce. On his next visit to England, they resume a relationship, but it's much more complicated and ugly than ever before, particularly because of the presence of Corinna, whom I hated even more on this read. Yeah, I understand, like, she was kind of, like, you know, groomed by Bruce, like, at such a young age, but she just, like, came across, like, an annoying, like, spoiled, like, little kid, overgrown little kid playing it, being grown up, and, like, Bruce is like, oh, I have to shelter her and coddle her and protect her in a way I never did with Amber. It's just like, oh, I just, I just, like, hated that so much. But still, Amber does not give up and is determined to follow Bruce wherever he goes to try to win him back, even if it means following him back to Virginia, transplanting her entire family and her most loyal servants, Nan, Tansy, and Big John Waterman, by whom Nan has had a child that we never even found out if it was a boy or a girl or even, like, what happened to it. Is the child still alive by this point at the story? Like, did Nan give him to a wet nurse and, or her to a wet nurse and, like, didn't take it back or did the child, like, die of a disease? So, like, I would have, maybe that wasn't something, again, that was, like, edited out of the first draft. And never seeing her beloved England or London ever again, like, whose social scene she has been, like, totally thriving in the role she was born to play. Nothing can make Amber give Bruce up, and she's even more determined to go after him, because she's now pregnant by him a third time. But just like Gone with the Wind, we don't know if Amber is going to win back her man, though we do know that a whole new series of adventures are just beginning. It's just begging for a sequel, which unfortunately was never written, but in, that might be kind of a good thing if you've like read or like even read part of like Scarlet by Alexandra Ripley. That was just oh so horrible. It's like, you know, it kind of makes you glad a Margaret Mitchell just left things as they were for the readers and fans to like fill in their own imagination what might have happened after the after the end. This book was banned in Boston when it came out in 1944 because it was so sexy and shocking for the era. But honestly, I don't view it as shocking at all. There aren't any real, real sex scenes, which I believe there would be because this book has such a shocking reputation. The type of book women say they had to hide under the mattress, though their mothers or husbands wouldn't discover what kind of thing they were reading. And there's like the one scene where it talks about um, um, George, um, Duke of Buckingham, um, George Villiers, um, Barbara Palmer's sleazy um, cousin. He pays Amber for a night of sex that's so like, you know, repulsive and perverted. It turns even Amber's stomach, but we're not told exactly what this like so-called perversion entailed. We have to use our you know own imaginations for that one. I can see why it would shock and titillate people in that day and age so strongly. But now it's nothing next to the type of dirty books and movies and like songs and music videos that come out on a regular basis. We had to start somewhere to move towards a point where people are less and less shocked by reading about infidelity, premarital sex, promiscuity, abortions, the kind of kinds of things that so shocked people in the 40s. I can also see why the name Amber began to be used more and more often after this book came out, though most people using it now probably have never heard of this book, nor have the modern bearers of its name. Amber St. Clair, like Scarlett O'Hara, certainly isn't the type of woman most mothers would want their daughters to emulate in many ways by how she cuckolds her husbands and lovers, steals, uh, steals other women's husbands and lovers, sleeps around, steps on and uses people without regard for their feelings to get to the top, and is all around a person who doesn't have the greatest morals to write home about. But what woman even today can get to the top by being meek, nice, sweet, passive, and submissive? 
Amber is a woman who knows what she wants and how to get it, and if she hurts innocent people on her way to doing it, so be it. She's a determined woman who rises to, rises to the top, something which no doormat, male or female, can hope for. So I hoped you enjoyed my, you know, like talking about this book. I know this video was a lot longer than I expected it might be, but it's a really, really long book. And I did like, you know, edit a lot of stuff out from my original Angel Fire review, which had even like more spoilers and like, you know, detailed blow by blow plot accounts. So I, I, again, like I really, really highly recommend this book, like, it's still in print all these years later. I'm not really, like, fond of this updated cover, but, you know, like, what can you do? Maybe someday they'll have another edition with a, like, a better cover, or at least one with, like, the whole face in the picture instead of, oh, look, my head is missing trend. And so, I like, please, I'm consider I'm leaving a comment if you've watched all the way through. Like, tell me if you've, like, read this book and what you thought of it, and I will see you guys again in my next video. Thanks again for watching. Bye.